So welcome, Nalini. It's great to have you here tonight. We sort of talked about doing this for some time and glad we're finally getting the chance. Great. Thank you so much, Sean. That was a wonderful introduction. And I'm so happy to be a part of um, the Natural History Institute and actively joining in on this wonderful <laughs> series. So um, thanks so much. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's great to have you. Um, and so as we did last time with Harry, and we'll do in the subsequent ones, there, there's, well, uh, most of the conversations will be uh, very specific to each person, but there's there's a couple of questions, one at the beginning and one at the end that I'm asking each of the four people. And so the first one of those is if you could just um, describe any recent natural history encounter that enriched your day in some way, and it doesn't necessarily have to be any big jaw dropping thing, but just but what what um what did you yeah. see well, do natural history of course as we all know is something <laughs> we do pretty much every day. And you know, as an ecologist, I would I guess I would respond by saying, well, you know, I'm always thinking about my next ecological question whenever I walk down the street or see a tree. But I have to say in terms of specifics, um I guess my most recent kind of significant natural history encounter was something I would never have anticipated my saying even just 10 years ago, and that is deer hunting. Um, I have uh. a good friend in uh, Olympia, Washington, where I lived for many years. And, you know, I used to just decry hunting. I used to think it was a horrible thing. Like, why would you want to kill a beautiful wild animal in the forest? But this friend of mine, Chris, said, well, you know, we are we have evolved as omnivores and you can take responsibility for actually killing an animal. And, you know, even if you're a vegetarian, you know, you pull up a carrot and eat it. And so I be, have become a hunter. So every fall, I take 10 days to go up to Washington State um, and hunt deer. And I find that that is actually when I am most attentive to the environment, even more so than when I'm at my study site, because, you know, you can't just clomp through the forest, you know, putting diameter tapes around trees. You have to be silent. <laughs> you have to be listening. You have to be attentive. You know, you have to spray a little powder to find out which way the wind is going because of, of your scent that can influence whether or not the deer will perceive you. Um, sometimes you go into deer stands, so you're actually sitting, sitting still for four or five hours at a time, just paying attention. And I find... You know, after two or three days of hunting, I find that my eye will catch like the fall of a single leaf. And then I know that I've reached an attentive point in my natural history practice because I've seen a tiny little bit of movement. And then if I do happen to kill a deer that season, you know, then I have the practice of of skinning it and taking the guts out and seeing the bladder and the liver and the heart. And those organs look so much like my own organs that it's it's a connection that I feel, a responsibility that I've taken. And um, I don't know, it's just a different way of thinking about doing natural history. And of course there are many ways, but when you ask that question, that's kind of what came to mind from, from this recent encounter with nature in that way. Yeah, that's great. I, I know by the way that that our previous speaker, Harry Green, who is with us tonight, um, would uh, uh, raise his fist in solidarity and, and has a right, similar. <laughs> and um, I mean, you could make, and some have made the case that that the practice of natural history or attentive to nature certainly has it sort of, in many ways, evolutionary roots in our role as hunters and gatherers as well um, uh, in our sort of deep human past. So thanks well, for sharing that. Best, um people who are who know and understand natural history are hunters that I meet in the forest. They, they mm -hmm. know about these animals. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Well, thank you for sharing that. Oh. Um, so I invited Nalini to um, to share uh, a short an excerpt from one of her writings. So uh, this might be a good time for that. And could you tell us? Just sure. uh, give us the context of what you're going to share with us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this actually comes from this wonderful book that I <laughs> edited called Nature Love Medicine. Um, and it's a set of essays on wildness and wellness. And he invited each of the authors to write from their own experience, their sort of relationship with, with nature and how their love was developed and how, why they love nature and then how that might have affected their health or the health of the planet. So I was going to read a little bit from... Um, because because I know that the 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 you know the, your your institute is really about not just about science but about including the humanities and the arts. I decided to le read a little piece of my essay, which is about what I learned by the inclusion of artists into my understanding of the forest. The small but fervent community of natural historians who investigate the canopy has documented the importance of canopy organisms around the world. 
Canopy biota produce large amounts of oxygen, store carbon dioxide, protect soil, retain water, and support wildlife species. Urban foresters have documented the ecosystem services provided by trees in urban settings, reductions in noise, temperature, and pollutants. Thus, the growing body of treetop research documents that the presence and protection of canopy diversity and function is essential to landscapes and to the humans who live in them. However, human practices have drastically reduced forest cover. Humans are becoming more and more separated from their connections to trees, soil, and wind, especially those living in urban environments. Midway into my academic career, I realized that communication of my scientific findings to other scientists did very little to fulfill my childhood dream of being a grown-up who protected trees. To foster a greater sense of mindfulness of trees, I needed an approach that would go beyond the facts and figures of science. I knew that the simple act of climbing from forest floor to the top of a tree changed my perspective of the forest. So I, re I reasoned that mindfulness might emerge from borrowing and lending perspectives and modes of communication from other ways of knowing the world. In 2003, I began staging a set of canopy confluences, week-long gatherings in remote forest sites to which I invited artists, writers, poets, dancers, rap singers, musicians, loggers, and tree novices, tundra-dwelling Inuits, and people who are blind. The simple construct of these confluence was for them to join me and my students into the treetops so that we might together explore the forest canopy and articulate what we perceive with the hope of providing new insights to all participants and producing materials that might better raise awareness to better protect the arboreal world. Our first staging area was Ellsworth Creek, which protects forests of Southwestern Washington. We rigged trees with climbing ropes and hoisted up four plywood platforms for, for participants to sit upon. On the ground, we set up tents, a cooking shelter and a campfire pit for a week of living in the forest. In the course of these interactions, participants taught me another way to love trees and natural history by providing me with the lenses through which they see the forest and express what they perceive. One of the participants, a modern dancer, gave me great insights. Jody Lomask is the artistic director and choreographer for a San Francisco-based professional modern dance group called Capacitor Incorporated. She wished to create a dance about symbiosis in tropical rainforests. I invited her and her seven dancers to join a canopy confluence in my study sites in Monteverde, Costa Rica. We spent a marvelous 10 days exploring and interpreting the flora and fauna through the medium of dance. I taught them how to climb my study trees, the limbs of which are covered with a riot of canopy dwelling plants of all shapes and sizes, from tiny mosses to gigantic arboreal shrubs. Aloft, the dancers took in all that they saw and smelled and felt, not with a measuring tape, clinometer, and write in the rain notebook as my students and I would have done, Rather, they recorded what they experienced with gestures of their hands, curves of their arms, and arcs of their eyebrows. After several days, they peeled off their clothes to merge more fully with the forest textures. I watched human limbs parallel tree limbs and human trunks intertwining with tree trunks. We performed her piece called Biome in Seattle and San Francisco to audiences who were drawn to dance rather than science. I started the show with a brief talk on the biodiversity and ecological fragility of the forest. Her troupe moved through the aesthetically beautiful dance she had choreographed. We had invited local conservation groups to offer volunteer opportunities from tables in the lobby, and scores of audience members signed up after witnessing the performance. Through those events that interwove art and science, I realized the power that emerges when we combine different ways of knowing and different ways of practicing natural history. During these multifaceted immersions, I found myself falling in love with the forest all over again. The different insights and ways of articulating their understanding provided for me a new affinity between trees and people. The word affinity from the Latin word affinis indicates a relation by marriage. Humans and trees hail from very different families, but the, connect the connections that Jody and the other participants in the confluences provided enabled me to consider myself as being married into a family of different people and of different trees with the challenges, responsibilities, and benefits that come with being so linked. 
That's wonderful. Thank you. That um sort of foretells certainly some some uh, parts of of uh, where some of the uh, themes I want to explore with you here this evening, um, which maybe we'll circle back to in a little bit, because I want to maybe provide a little bit of context, especially for some who might be here who may not be as familiar with some of your work. Um, and I also wanted to say uh, to everyone um, uh, watching and listening again, since I think we have some new people joining, is um, invite you if you have questions or comments for Nalini, uh, please uh, use the Q&A function that's at the bottom of, of the Zoom screen and you can start adding questions and comments at any point. Uh, they won't be disruptive at all. We'll, we'll get to them towards the end. So uh, please do so and, and you can participate in this conversation in that way. Um, so again, Nalini, if could you, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, and as comes clear already in what you've said so far, you know, you you have a deep love of trees and forests, and and um, you know, I think it's no stretch to say a love affair <laughs> with trees, and that, and I know we've talked, and that that's been a lifelong mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, aspect of your life, and and um, can you just tell us a little bit about how? How that, you know, when were you first aware of that and how has that manifested at different stages of your life? Um, and, sure. and how did that lead to being a research scientist and then veering away in the way yeah. you just described? Well, you know, I think many, many biologists and ecologists um, and natural historians, the love or the connection or the sense of, boy, I want to learn more. All of that really often, often often, often started as a kid. And that was true of me too. Um, you know, I don't know whether Harry Green was collecting snakes when he was six years old, but I know that when I was six years old, I would, I was be, a yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would be, um, I would be climbing the trees, uh, in, in, uh, my parents' front yard. I grew up in Bethesda, Maryland, just outside of Washington, DC, which as many of you know, is, you know, home to beautiful Eastern deciduous forests. And there were these eight maple trees, silver maple trees that, um, lined the driveway of my parents' Uh, home. And I remember I was the only one, I was one of five kids, but I was the only one who really sort of loved nature and went tree climbing after school pretty much every day. And for me, I guess it was not only fun, but to me, it sort of felt like a refuge, those, the tops of those eight maple trees, because I, it was my place, you know, and my home was sort of a chaotic place. My dad was from India. My mother was from Brooklyn, New York. We had dogs and cats and homework and four brothers and sisters. <laughs> And so it was sort of this place of calm, a place of, in a funny way, safety for me. And so, and it was a place of interesting things going on. You know, I remember watching the squirrels going from one limb to another and sort of envying them and thinking about, boy, you know, if I tied a spool of thread, I could sort of, you know, and, and let the squirrels go, I could sort of figure out what their route was through the, through the trees. And I, they just, the being in the trees generated questions for me. It wasn't just like fun and and a refuge, it was also a place of curiosity. Like why, you know, why did that limb fall off and not this one? And I remember as a kid thinking, when I grow up, you know, I'm gonna invent this special magic microphone that I can insert <laughs> in free with headphones and ask it questions. And I bet that the answers would come out really slow, you know, because <laughs> the trees would grow slowly and I'd have to like invent a way to speed it up to get the answers. And, and actually, although, you know, as a grown up, I never have been able to invent that magic tree microphone. I realized Tom in a funny way that, that having chosen the path of science is in some ways that magic microphone, because we as scientists or natural historians are always asking questions of trees or whatever aspect of nature, and then doing observations or experiments or modeling um, in order to get those answers. So I guess that was the sort of natural progression for me as a kid who loved trees, wanted to protect them, wanted to be in contact with them, of choosing this route of studying them in college, majoring in, you know, in ecology, going on to get my PhD in forest ecology, choosing a topic, the forest canopy and its organisms as my sort of central question, and then having the wonderful opportunity and luck, I guess, of of being able to pursue that, of being able to pursue the very questions that I was so excited about as a kid. So I feel really fortunate that that I've been one of these academics who's been able to really pursue a passion that started, you know, now almost, almost well, I hate to say how long ago, but, it's, you know, <laughs> 60 years ago, um, that started, you know, just shinning up into those those trees in front in my parents' front yard. 
That's awesome. And it, it's, it's interesting to hear that you, even back then that the, the sort of, the, the sort of asking of questions, which is the root of science of the scientific yes. process was already an explicit part of your, mm-hmm. of your encounter. Yeah. Um, yeah, which uh, um, that's that's very interesting. Um, well, that is great. And can you, um, you know, we we've mentioned several times uh, the word canopy, and it dawns on me that maybe not everybody who's watching here is totally familiar with what that means in the concept of forest. So, can you tell us a little bit about, I guess, your scientific work in general, and and particularly in the um, exploration of forest canopies. And, and, you know, also like where that was at when you started doing it, because yeah, it, there's been a yeah. lot of change. Yeah. Yes, there has. That's right. Yeah. So forest canopies are, there's really actually no technical definition that every single forest ecologist agrees on in terms of what is a canopy. There's no like height above the forest floor. We simply consider the tops of the trees, the upper part of the forest as the forest canopy. Um, and it could be any kind of forest. It can be a short little dumpy forest like what we have here in Utah with gamble oaks, you know, just six feet high. Or it can be the amazing forest, dip terracotta forest of, you know, of, of Borneo, where you, you can climb 250 feet up into that forest canopy. We know that the canopy tends to have a different kind of micro environment than what you see on the forest floor, more exposure to sunlight, more wind, greater extremes of relative humidity. And for that reason, there's just an amazing number of plants and animals that have adapted to the canopy microenvironment and also the architecture of the canopy. These You can imagine when you climb a tree that you're seeing these sort of suspended cylinders that can support canopy dwelling plants and animals, very different from the planar surface of, of the forest floor. And when I was starting out as a graduate student, you know, and every graduate student, as you know, has to choose some sort of specialty within <laughs> a, an area of study. Um, my first encounter with the tropical rainforest was a, a course, uh, sort of a natural history tropical biology class in Costa Rica. Um, and I remember going to the Monte Verde cloud forest when you just sort of look up and there are these plants and monkeys and hummingbirds and dripping with mosses and bromeliads and ferns and I remember asking my major professor who was there in the forest with me, like, what's going on up in the canopy? And he said, well, we don't really know much about <laughs> it. There's no way to get up there safely. And so at that time, this was about 1980, the forest canopy was almost completely unknown in terms of scientifically. Now, we know we knew, you know, botanists, obviously, and, and animal biologists know that ant- plants and animals live up there because when a tree falls down, they basically have harvested those plants. But it was sort of like studying marine biology before scuba. Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. dredge these marine organisms from the bottom of the ocean and say, oh, look at this thing, look at that thing. But you didn't know how they behaved, how they lived, how they reproduced, and most of all, how they interacted with their environment down in the ocean benthos. So it was- And how they were patterned together. Exactly. So for me, when I was looking into studying the canopy, it really was- and. It, it was called at that time, get this, Tom, it was called The Last Biotic Frontier. <laughs> now, if you're a young graduate student looking to discover things and contribute to the scientific record, what could be more compelling than both <laughs> combining tree climbing, if you love tree climbing as I did, combining being in the forest and then exploring this last biotic frontier and really thinking, I might make a real contribution to the to science if I, if I climb into the canopy and start studying. So my first early work was was very basic. It was really like 19th century science, like biology. It's like, what is up there? Who's up there? How much is up there? All of these super basic descriptive Natural history. <laughs> natural history of, of just describing the environment, describing the distribution, describing, not even getting at the more interesting, I think, questions about function or physiology or interactions. So the first five or 10 years of my work was basically descriptive, quantifying the biomass of those canopy plants, um, looking at their nutrient content so I could quantify the amount of nutrients that were stored up there. And then after I had done that, I was able to look at fluxes of nutrients from the canopy to the forest floor, fluxes of nutrients from outside the ecosystem that are captured by these canopy dwelling plants that have adaptations that can intercept and hold on to atmospherically born nutrients and holding them into the canopy. And then as they pass from the canopy to the forest floor by falling or by riding down tree falls and branches, what is the contribution of those canopy dwelling plants 
to the nutrient cycles of the forest as a whole. And that then led to other experiments where we began looking at, um, you know, what is the what is the input of intercepted tree litter to these canopy dwelling plants? Is it all atmospheric, or can there be some internal nutrients as well? And it was in the early '90s that we became, I and we, and pretty much every tropical biologist became more aware of the effects of human activities, of deforestation, of fragmentation, of climate change, on on tropical forests. And so I became very interested in looking at the effects of disturbance. We started doing mm -hmm. some experiments with physical removal of, of these canopy dwelling plants. We learned that they take decades to grow back, even though they look so lush, it turns out it took like 20 years for just 40% of the cover to return after we had stripped off branches. Mm -hmm. We began doing transplant experiments to look at the effects of climate change on these plants and found really negative effects. Um, and so all of those sort of have led to my interest in looking at relic trees and pastures and their canopy communities. And my most recent work that's ongoing right now with three other colleagues um, is trying to look at the effects of climate change on canopy dwelling plants and their host trees. And we're doing some massive large scale stripping experiments of the removing the epiphytes from whole trees to understand the effects of that, which is sort of predicted by what's happening with climate change on the host trees themselves. So I would say the evolution of canopy science over 40 years, it's a remarkably short time, has moved from this sort of natural history, descriptive work into experimental work to look at processes and now trying to make predictions about what will happen at a large spatial scale. Really exciting to sort of have seen that that evolution of canopy studies from the very beginning to where it's headed now. And you know, now we're using new tools like drones and remote sensing to try to understand what's going on with forest canopies at a, at a, at a landscape scale and also at a global scale. So if there are any young students out there who are listening to this, just think about canopy studies as, a, as an area of study that is just primed and ripe for young people or older people, you know, to get involved with with its with research about it. And just to and to, just to emphasize, you you didn't just see this change over forty years, but you played a pretty key role in propelling it forward well, as well. There were many people <laughs> who contributed to this. I happen to be one of the early people. But you know, you mentioned the International Canopy Network, and that was a group that we started in um, 1996 when canopy studies were just sort of getting rolling. And there were very few canopy researchers. It was really very specialized and very you know, pretty much there was one person at one university who was doing canopy work. So we really needed a network for exchange, just like any scientific discipline, or I assume humanities or arts disciplines, you need a network of people to reinforce and support um, the, the work that you do. And so we constructed this, this little nonprofit um, that allowed the exchange among scientists, but we were also always promoting um, the development of educational materials that would we could provide for teachers and for conservationists, for policymakers and for educators. Um, so that was something that we started early on, um, you know, with a monthly newsletter and with a database of canopy articles, uh, with conferences that we organized and so forth. So it was a little sort of mini network within the world of forest studies. Cool. And just, just to clarify a couple of things for folks, so that uh, for one thing, it's just the logistics of this. Like you're, you're not just leaping from branch to branch as you did when you were um, a child, right? <laughs> you're, you're, you're using essentially, you know, rock climbing gear, right? To, you right. Know, and, yeah, and to do it in a safe manner and so on. Yeah. So, and that's another sort of feature of canopy studies is this whole question of, well, how the heck do you get up to these trees in these trees? And of course you want to do it non-destructively to the tree because originally people were putting spikes, those like spikes that, you know, telephone people use to put into the tree. And of course that became a no-no early on, uh, but also to make it safe for people who were climbing up there. Um, so we've been, you know, there are now a variety of canopy access techniques from walkways where people can make observations of birds. I use, and many, many people use mountain climbing techniques to get up there using ropes and arborist techniques to get up there. But we've also been using hot air balloons. There's a wonderful group from France that has been using what they call the canopy raft. Uh, we use construction canopy. Excuse me, construction cranes. There are 17 construction cranes that have been installed in different forest types around the world um, that really provide access not only to the 
the tree in the interior, the way we get to with our mountain climbing techniques, but also the envelope of the atmosphere just above the forest canopy. So I would say that in many ways, um, you know, the, the challenge that, that someone like me faced 40 years ago to get, how do you get up to the canopy had really largely been solved. And so the mm -hmm. stories that we tell are not so much about, well, here's how I tie the knot that allows me to get up to the canopy, uh, but right. rather the stories are now about what we're actually discovering scientifically up there. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I think as you suggested that, I think one thing that is that is an outgrowth of this um, is that the, the, the encounter experience with canopy um, habitats has spread and is much more of a common experience for the general public to have. Yes. You know, as an example, as you know, I, I, I lead trips each winter to Ecuador and um, there's one tree in the in the Amazon basin there that we have visited many, many times. And it, it has become almost like a holy place to me being up in that uh, canopy, wow. watching tanagers drinking out of water pooled in bromeliads and yeah, all that kind that, of stuff. That and, is, um... That's and great. it's just and it's just watching so many people be touched by that place. In fact, somebody on the um, and the with us here tonight is going to be there with me this winter. So um, I think yeah. So there, there's a ahead. whole other realm which is recreational tree climbing. You know, and that was something that we in the International Canopy Network used to, used to really worry about. About oh no, is that going to be done in a way that isn't destructive to the trees? Um, and there's a whole world of canopy zip lining. I mean, in Monteverde, Costa Rica, where I work, there are probably seven or eight different zip mm -hmm. lining companies where ecotourists can go and they, you know, it's mostly an attraction to the, the thrill of zipping through at 60 miles an hour. But I think there's also a greater appreciation of the diversity of the structure of the forest, the diversity of the biota that live in the forest amongst these, these ecotourists that are enjoying the thrill, but also are absorbing the diversity and the functions of these plants that they're they're going by at 60 miles an hour. So <laughs> right, right. I think it, I've done I think it myself. Has really increased its yeah. its reach in, in many wonderful yeah. ways. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so um just to be clear, you you a great deal of this work has has been at the Monteverde Cloud Forest in Costa Rica, but you've also right. done a lot of work uh, I think more recently in the Olympic Peninsula of Washington yes. and at, so um, kind of extending out from that, um, so you've had this kind of, you know, decades long uh, sort of commitment to place, especially Monteverde, yeah. and um, uh, to, you know, to really like keep going back to the same place over yeah. and over. And um, do you, well, what would you say about the importance of, of, of doing that, of, of having like this um, extensive, long-term relationship with a particular place oh. and that you know, place in particular. Great, yeah. That's that's a great question, Tom. Um, you know, when I look at my passport compared to my husband, Jack Longino, who's an entomologist, you know, he's a taxonomist. So he goes to different places every time to collect his ants. And so his passport has like dozens and dozens <laughs> of countries and my passport is really boring because it's like Costa Rica, Costa Rica, Costa Rica. <laughs> the reason is because when you do ecosystem ecology, when you're trying to understand the pools and flows of nutrients and water, the interactions of these canopy plants with wildlife, it, you really have to focus on one single place. So that meant when I started my studies, I had to invest in this plot of land in the research area of the Monteverde Cloud Forest Reserve. I set up a four hectare plot. Um, we marked and measured and identified over 3000 trees in those plots so that we know those trees. We've rigged and climbed probably about 75 trees that have permanent lines in them so that we go up and down the same trees. And so that has allowed us to ask different kinds of questions than you know what a drive-by taxonomist might do. So we've been able to do long-term studies. Like I mentioned before that we, we studied recovery rates after we stripped off those, those mats of epiphytes or canopy plants from branches. Well, it took 22 years. It took 13 years to get anything coming back. 13 wow. years. That was completely counter to what I had expected because these, these plants grow everywhere. I thought, oh, well, next year, you know, I won't even be able to tell where they, I had taken the plants off. But no, it was year after year coming back to the same tree, the same branch, taking photographs of it, making my measurements. 
And so I came to understand that, in fact, this was a long-term phenomenon, this recolonization of these canopy plants that I would never have known about if I had gone flitting off to some other study site. Same right, thing right. with mortality. Because we had tagged those trees, we recensus them every five years. We now know what the dance of that forest is over, over 40 years. It turns out that the tree turnover rates, the rates at which trees fall in this very, very windy cloud forest in Monteverde is just about the same as lowland tropical forests, about 1.5% per year. Again, I never would have been able to figure that out if I hadn't come back to those same plots, those same trees, looking for those tags and, and being able to do the analysis of that same piece of ground. And it also has allowed me to share that plot with other scientists, with other ecologists. So Greg mm. Goldsmith, for example, fantastic tree physiologist, has been able to sort of piggyback his research in our study plots. Jessica Murray has been able to do soil microbial studies in our plots, climbing those trees where we've been measuring the microclimate so she can now use our measurements to help her understand what's going on with canopy soil microbes. So I think there are wonderful things about trotting the, the world and collecting organisms and, and data from different sites, but there are, I think, equally wonderful things about being literally rooted in a particular study site in order to understand both long-term interactions of the biota there, as well as sharing out what we have discovered and what we can provide to other scientists. Yeah. So, and, uh, so you might say that in terms of the science aspect of it, there's certain really important questions that simply can't be answered quickly because they're longer term right. processes like what you just described. And then in the in the maybe more the larger sense of just our human connection with the place that long term we learn differently and a long term love uh, relationship yeah. is a different thing, just That's like a long term marriage is different yeah, than a new romance. Or You're right. You know how I feel about my wonderful husband. You know, I've been we've been married 40 years. That's a very different kind of love that we have come to after 40 years different ways of expressing it, different ways of feeling it, different values that we have for each other than those early days when we were courting each other and, you know, just right. so right. excited. And, and um, so, yeah, different ways of loving. That's a lovely thing yeah. to think about, Tom. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm, I'm glad, happy to see that some people are adding their questions and comments to the Q&A. And so, again, invite you to, to do that. Um, and we will make sure to get to as many of those as we can. There's so many things I want to talk to you about. Um, so. Um, one of the um, uh, well, part of the part of the title of of the program was here was uh, was passionate science, but also was creative solutions. And one thing I so much admire about your work, Nalini, is that you have just been so creative in terms of reaching out from the sciences. And you already in the reading that you shared, you talked about um, connecting with dancers. But you've you've done you've worked with prisoners. You worked with with places of worship. You've worked with the fashion industry, um, and and more. And we mentioned earlier about uh, treetop Barbie. So um, so first of all, can you just uh, maybe quickly describe some of the range of those different kinds of projects that you've done, and and then um, I, well, I and then I have a, sort of a follow up. Why I thought that was or think that that's important. Um, you know, scientists, you know, tend to have this sort of insular outlook, which is, you know, a piece of research is done once you publish it in a scientific journal and that then check, you you know, you're done with that piece of work. But I guess it really was my being a tropical biologist during the early 1990s when it was so clear that human activities were having a negative effect. And I felt like, well, it's all well and good to publish these papers about epiphytes and you know, but five or 10 people will read and be very interested in them, but that's not doing really much direct good in terms of protecting these forests. And that's when I thought, oh, well, I need to do something more than, in addition to what, I mean, it's not like contributing to the scientific record is useless. I think it's one of the most important things a person can do. But I, I felt myself that I, I needed to, I wanted to do something in addition to that. And at first I tried talking to policymakers, but I found I really hated it and I was terrible at it because they always wanted like, how many species are gonna go extinct by which year? And I just couldn't answer those questions and I felt really uncomfortable. But I thought, well, maybe I can do public engagement. You know, a brown woman climbing 200 feet into the canopy is a pretty <laughs> cool thing that's to sell to other people. And so I said, okay, I'm gonna do public engagement work. That's gonna be my contribution of convincing people or engaging people 
about the importance and the wonder of trees and their ecological values. So I worked with National Geographic. I you know, gave talks in museums. I wrote for natural history magazines. And I realized pretty soon that the people who read those magazines are already convinced that trees are important. And that's what sort of sparked me to think about how do I go beyond the choir? And so that was my first sort of attempt was, um, was Treetop Barbie because I remembered I was inspired to want to save trees when I was a little girl. But what does a little girl in New York City or Tokyo or Nairobi do if there's there's no trees around to climb? And so I began thinking, well, what is it that little girls value? And my own daughter said, you know, was at that stage where she was saying, mom, can I have a Barbie? And I was horrified. <laughs> um, but I said, well, Barbie is the magic thing because lots and lots of little girls love it. And so that's when I approached Mattel to say, well, how about a treetop Barbie? They weren't interested. And so my students and I made our own treetop Barbies. We got volunteer seamstresses to make clothes. We bought used Barbies at Goodwill stores. We made a little booklet about, you know, canopy plants that we sent out. I, I sold her on my website, you know, like, like how many I heard people? I heard a rumor that the treetop yeah. Barbie might be lingering nearby. Might we have but a there is, But then last year, I got a call from National Geographic and they had partnered with Mattel to create a line called Explorer Barbies, asked me to be a an advisor, which I did. I was so happy to do that. And as a thank you, they made a, a one of a kind Malini lookalike treetop Barbie, <laughs> which I do have here. This is the Nalini lookalike Barbie. You can see she has a little gray streak in her hair. <laughs> That's great. She does come with her very own right in the rain. Nose. Just like this. <laughs> so to me, it was important, not just because, well, now there's, you know, Explorer Barbies available to little girls who might want to say, oh, I would like to do something like that when I grow up. But I think it also means something hopeful, which is Back in 2004, when I first started approaching Mattel about this, they said, no, we're not interested. Forget it. Um, there's there's no market for it. But in 2022, there is a market for it. There are enough little girls who want to get a, you know an Explorer Barbie. So I think it shows that society has shifted just in 15 years, that there are more little girls and boys, perhaps, who... Um, who might aspire to having some kind of a natural history job or explore the canopy or explore the polar regions of the world or whatever. So I think it was a really happy story. And it also taught me that if you knock on the door of some institution like Mattel that seems completely closed off, and it was closed off, if you keep going at it, if you try to figure out a way to work it out, like making your own Barbies and going to Goodwill and, you know, it, it might actually come true. Like it did come true. And so I think to me, what it taught me was try it. If it doesn't seem to work, continue to try it at whatever scale you can. And then if it happens that it is successful, well, that's wonderful. And so I just really feel like sometimes scientists feel like, oh, well, that can't happen. Oh, well, that will never happen. And so we give up and not just scientists, but people. And I think something that I've learned in approaching groups that seem far away from science or closed off to science, like the world of Mattel and toy manufacturing, you know, if you if you approach that institution with this open heart and with a sense of trying and with the strength that nature has, then I think, you know, there's a possibility it might come true. And that has come true. You know, science and religion seem to be very far apart you know, the creationism versus evolution debates, we've all seen those and go like, oh, that's hopeless. But the way that I approached it was again, in this sort of more quiet way, which is to say, well, I understand the ecological values of trees, but not maybe not everyone does, but there are other values of trees. For example, they are religious symbols in many world religions, and they are written about in the holy scriptures of world religions, and people who read those believe in their holy scriptures. And so why don't I use the authorities of the religious people for my my bases, my data, instead of scientific data. So I read the Bible, the Old Testament, the New Testament. I, I downloaded the Quran and the Talmud and did a search for the words tree and forest. And I came up with all this data. There are all these verses in these holy scriptures that relate and describe trees. And they're all very positive, you know, analogies to God, practical <clears throat> use, location markers. There are a lot of holidays, religious holidays, Tub Shabbat. The Jews celebrate Tub Shabbat, which is this celebration of the new year for the trees. Buddha found enlightenment under right. a tree. 
uh, you know, there are all these references to trees and religious scriptures. So then I put together a sermon called Trees and Spirituality, started knocking on the doors of churches, started with the Unitarians, of course, uh, and they invited <laughs> me in and I gave this sermon. And then they sort of, I sort of got, you know, passed around from religion to religion, church to church, synagogue to synagogue. And I've ended up, you know, being able to have great conversations with religious people. We've had tree plantings in seminary grounds. We've done bio blitzes on church grounds. I've made little pamphlets about the trees that live in churchyards, sacred ground, sacred trees, sacred soil. And the pamphlets have information both from biology, but also from the holy scriptures. And so in that way, it's been not a difficult task to bridge, to bridge science and religion but the approach is not to force ecology and science down the throats of people who might not value or understand it, um, but instead to say, well, let's see what you think about trees. And here's some authorities that you believe in, and let's take it from there. And the great thing is, I don't have to become religious myself. I don't have right, to be right. Baptist to visit a Baptist church and talk about a Baptist, what, what he or she believes in. I can just be who I am, you know, this yeah. Hindu, that, that that's a great thing. So we don't have to adopt the people or the beliefs and values of the people with whom we interact. And I think that was a really important lesson too. That's wonderful. Yeah, I I, uh, I think I told you somewhere that I used to use an article that you wrote a number of years ago in, in my conservation biology course that was called Not Preaching to the Choir. Yeah, that, that that outlined some of these because I thought it was just a great model for for students yeah. to see and yeah. um, um, so I and I'm I'm interested. I mean, I as I said, I really admired this this part, this creativity that you have, and and I'm interested in how what how might it be more rec replicable for other scientists who might be a little mm -hmm. a little more timid than you have been yeah. in reaching out. And a, a couple things in what you said jump out at me, and one. One is, um, as you said, having an open heart and 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 not sort of prejudging, not being too reactive. And the other thing is is sort of a sort of like good-hearted persistence, you might say. Like the Mattel example, you you uh, you gave them the opportunity to catch up with you, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and they did. So those, I think those are a couple interesting um, principles. Yeah. So yeah, Tom, you, you've really hit on a very important one, and I'll I'll talk about that, especially in in um in the context of my work with prisons. I mean, I think uh -huh. all of us are aware of the incredible, really the incredibly in, unjust system. Our system of mass incarceration here is in our country. The fact that there are disproportionate incarceration rates for Black and and Latino and Amer and Native Americans in our prisons. Um, there's just so much injustice in the system, and we know that that's not the way to go about treating people who, by whatever circumstance, have, have broken laws. Um, and so I had to kind of get over my aversion to the system of mass incarceration in order to approach the, the prison system to bring science lectures and conservation projects to people who are incarcerated inside state prisons and county jails and juvenile detention centers. Um, and it started with the, 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 again, the power of natural history. I was trying to find a way in the Pacific Northwest to learn how to, to cultivate mosses because there's a whole moss um, collection sort of industry in, in Washington state where people go and collect, gather mosses for the horticulture trade. And as my research has shown, these stripping off mosses from branches takes a very long time for them to recolonize. So I thought if I could learn how to farm mosses, that might take pressure off of collecting them from the wild. But no, but there's no data on how to how to cultivate mosses because people have always just taken them out of the wild forest. So I thought that prisoners, that is people who have been incarcerated, who are, they are the people who have the least access to nature, to conservation and to science education. So I approached a small minimum security prison just a half an hour from the Evergreen State College. And I offered to the warden, the superintendent, you know, could I interact and engage your inmates with learning how to grow mosses? He turned out to be a very forward thinking uh, superintendent. We did that project after 18 months, we had data on which grow mosses grow fastest. The men inside really loved doing it because they were interacting with living things. I loved it because I was getting answers to my scientific questions and the superintendent loved it because he saw that the men were interacting and talking together. And that then expanded and grew into a science lecture series. We began collaborating with other wildlife 
uh, conservation groups to rear endangered species like the Oregon spotted frog and the Taylor checker spot butterfly. And that then has sort of expanded to other prisons in other states. So that was about really about suspending my initial aversion to a system by approaching it with, I guess I would say intellectual humility of saying, yep, you know, I don't agree with the precepts that your institution is based on, but this connection with natural history, this connection with conservation, providing an opportunity to contribute to people from whom the ability to contribute has been taken away was more important. And we've actually sort of seen an exchange that way. So, and I started small. So I think that one aspect that I could give advice for re replicability is to, is to say, start small, to approach another group with intellectual humility. But I think an even more key piece of that, Tom, is that the only thing that holds us from doing this kind of work is that we seem to think that we don't have permission to do it. Mm. But we do have permission to do it. That is, you know, if you're a grad student, maybe your your major professor says, oh, you have to spend all of your time, you know, working on your graduate work, but there's always time to do some sort of small thing. Um, the other thing is that we also feel like we don't have permission to show who we are as whole people to the world. In the practice of science, especially in academics, we are supposed to just be scientists, to be anonymous. In fact, when we publish papers, we use our initials. We don't, people don't even know if we're, you know, what gender we are. And so I think there's that sense of, I need to show that I'm, sub I'm objective. So that means I can't reveal if I'm a mother or if I play soccer, or if I, you know, if I'm actually, you know, from Budapest. And so, but those are the qualities that allow you to connect with non-scientific groups. Right. For me, going to churches, I could do that because my dad's a Hindu, my mother's an Orthodox Jew. I grew up just not even caring about what religion anybody is because I saw that essentially all religions are the same. So not a problem. <laughs> but maybe one of you is a Catholic or an Episcopalian or a Muslim. Well, you have a connection to other Catholics and Episcopalians and Muslims because you are of that group. So you might choose to interact with that with that group and you would be sort of, you'd have a head start on it. You would know how to communicate with them. I'm a hunter. I've given classes and hunter education classes at my local rifle range about the effects of climate change on Aspen, which is a food of elk here. And, and I can do that because I kind of know the language of hunters. So if you have some hobby or parental status or nationality or interest, you can draw upon that as well as your research topic to find groups in society that you can easily interact with and you have permission to do it. There's no problem. It doesn't mean it's gonna compromise your science. Yeah, I don't, yeah, yeah. I'm not, even though I love trees, I can still take my chainsaw and cut branches off and lower them to the ground to measure the epiphytes on them. It yeah, doesn't yeah. cut down your objectivity. It just means that you are, again, Tom, opening that heart to natural history and to biology and sharing that with people who may come to love it for reasons other than the reason you love it. It might be religion. It might be contact with nature. It might be uh, elk are going to, I'm going to be able to shoot an elk easier because I better understand aspen trees. But that's, that's the secret. I think that's the replicability that I have come mm -hmm. to understand after approaching these many different kinds of audiences. Yeah, that's great. That's such a great story. And yeah, I think tied into that idea of remembering that you have permission is just sort of a willingness to initially at least sort of challenge yourself to step a little bit outside of your comfort zone. And, and, yeah. and, the, and, um, and you've obviously done that in a number of different ways. Um, I, I see that we're, we're, we're running, um, you know, it's getting a little bit later. So I, I do want to ask you one more question and then see if we can get to some of the um, um, some of the questions that have come in and comments from the group. Um, the And again, if you uh, haven't already done so and would like to, the, the Q&A tab is down at the bottom of the screen. Um, so um, this is the other question that I've, that I've asked, that I'm asking each of the, of the, um, the guests. So the subtitle of the series is Facing the Future in This Present Moment. And obviously we're living in daunting times and on so many different levels. Um, so I think there's, a, there's an important um, balance between having, having vision and finding hope and also not being living in delusion about you know, what we can and can't do. And so what is your sort of, what's the most um, 
hopeful, positive world that you can mm. feasibly see coming about? Like, like yeah. what's that balance for you or, or what gives you hope? And, and, and you've sort of, you've, you've addressed some of this already, but. Yeah. yeah. Um, I guess I would say two things really give me hope. One is when I've interacted with many young people, like our daughter, Ricky, is a, is a millennial and they have a an urban farm where they raise herbs and um, native plants. And they also started a seed saving program in our city library. And they live very differently than I do. They don't have like a career the way I sort of built a career with going to graduate school. But when I look at their gatherings and the way they look at the earth and how important it is to them and how they share that with other people, that gives me hope. And I see that in many, many young people, the concern and the translation to some kind of action. I think the second thing, in addition to sort of looking towards young people, is is the is the hopeful act of acting small. And as I said, you know, I started with one sermon. I started with one minimum security prison, and I've seen that those programs can grow. And I think that sometimes we fall on the side of despair instead of hope when we think, oh, I can only do small things. But I've also thought about and done a little bit of math on this. Um, if we as scientists collectively do small things, we can really have a big effect. Like there are 325 million people in our country. There are 6.2 million scientists in our country. That means when you do the math, if each of us scientists talks to just 52 people a year, that's one person a week, we will have talked and had a conversation about science or natural history or ecology with every single person in our country. And so, you know, giving having a chat with your barista about shade grown coffee or your Uber driver about, you know, electric cars, that's not hard to do. Um, and I think even though if even though these acts are small, I think for me at least, they keep me along that knife ridge instead of falling too much on the side of hope or saying, oh, I can do these gigantic things, which I probably can't, or falling on the side of despair, which then renders me immobile and I don't do anything. I think the act of doing small things collectively is something that gives me hope for the future. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you for that. So, well, we could talk all night, but um, of course we don't have all night. So I do wanna um, try to turn towards some of the questions that have been coming in. Um, and I know some people may have to step out um, uh, before we're completely done. Um, and so I just wanna say, um, and I'll repeat this again at the end, but, this evening's program will be available uh, and archived on the uh, Natural History Institute's YouTube channel. It will actually be there immediately after um, after the program tonight, although tomorrow um, the NHI staff will do a little bit of editing to trim off the, the, the opening 10 minutes or so while people were coming in. And we encourage you to check that out and, and you can share it with anybody who, who you think uh, may have wished they were here tonight. Um, so, and I'm gonna um, to try to to get to as many of these as possible. I'm, I'm I may merge a few together a little bit. Um, so, um, so the first couple of questions that came in um, from Sarah and Catherine. Um, one was thanking you for sharing your viewpoint from the the maple trees of your childhood, and asked if there's anything else special about the canopies of the eastern deciduous forest that you learn. And then and then Catherine uh, asked a similar question or related, which was. What are what are some specific differences between deciduous deciduous and coniferous canopies? Mm -hmm. So any part of that that you'd like yeah, to sure. jump on? Yeah, sure. Yeah, well, certainly the structure and the timing, the dynamics of the foliage of those are obviously different. Um, and you know, the, you, every tree crown and every forest has kind of different structural and functional <laughs> characteristics. There are some in common. Um, when I think about for instance, in the temperate rainforest, of, I'll just give one example, the temperate rainforest of the Pacific Northwest, where I've done a lot of work, as Tom mentioned, you know, there's there's a dominance of, of coniferous trees, but there are also a number of really wonderful deciduous trees. And what we find is that the mosses, the, the canopy dwelling mosses are much more abundant and diverse on the deciduous trees. And I think this is because for part of the year, the wet part of the year from November, you know, November to March, the deciduous trees have lost their leaves. And so they're exposing their branches to higher levels of sunlight. And that's, so the mosses then have the opportunity to take advantage of not only the moisture that's there during the wet season, but also the sunlight. 
So the evergreen trees by self-shading then become a less hospital environment for those canopy dwelling mosses. So I think that it's it's just sort of, it, it's kind of intuitive in terms of the fact that these trees are very different in their structure and their function, but there are some commonalities between the two. Great, thank you. Thanks for the questions. Um, Johnny says, greetings from Evergreen. <laughs> um, and that he, uh, I think it's he had heard that you discovered as part of your work uh, that trees put out aerial roots uh, mm -hmm. in their canopies to engage in symbiotic exchange with the plants growing there. And is, is that true or anything you want to say about that? Yeah, actually, um, Johnny, that was a kind of the discovery that kind of put me and my work on the map. That, because when I was climbing into these big leaf maple trees, these deciduous trees, they not only have mosses, but they also accumulate this canopy soil. And I was cutting off mats of these epiphytes, doing that early descriptive work I mentioned about just quantifying the biomass of material up in the forest canopy. And as I pulled back those mats of living plants and this, this thick layer of canopy soils, I kept finding these roots, these vascular plant roots running along the branch surfaces and the trunk surfaces. And first of all, well, that's weird. You know, there are no vascular plants growing in the canopy. There's a fern and then there are mosses, but these were vascular plant roots. And when I traced them back, it turned out that they originated from the trunks and the branches of the host trees themselves. So these were at what we call adventitious roots that were coming out in, in sort of response to that moist, dark, organic matter that was full of nutrients, full of water. And there was a direct conduit then between these nutrients that were accumulated by the epiphytes and the very host trees that supported them. And because people hadn't climbed into the canopy to sort of just barge around up there, I was the first person who discovered them. It was such a simple, discovery; it was ridiculously simple, but I recognized that this was actually a sort of a shortcut in nutrient cycling. And that was a significant sort of both physiological and ecological aspect of trees that hadn't been discovered before. And after that, I started looking at other tree species and other rainforests around the world. And I found that this is actually quite a common physiological response to the presence of canopy dwelling plants and soil across many different plant families of trees, many different ecosystems. Um, but what you have then is this sort of symbiotic relationship between the canopy dwelling plants, the soils they accumulate and the trees that support them. That's so great, thank you. So again, um, trying to, to uh, get to as many of these as we can um, and, and some uh, like our, our friend Dave's uh, question, he points out you've already, actually already answered since he put it up here. Um, a couple other things about canopies. Well, well, first of all, there's 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 uh, uh, several that are just thanking you for being an inspiration, uh, both tonight and for a long time. And um, and um, uh, one of those people is uh, Thalix, uh, who says that they've been working in the canopy of the Oregon Coast Range for four years on a, a study of red tree voles, which are, are uh, small arboreal rodents. And that as climate change and logging are impacting them, they, she's, they've been thinking about the idea of assisted migration, which essentially is intentional moving of part of a species to a new place and uh, asks what effects would you foresee in having to translocate the voles across the Columbia because some of the denser forests mm -hmm. uh, north of the Columbia River seem like they might be better than those in Oregon. And, and and I'll just add that Salix also said that uh, one uh, specific reason you've been an in, uh, inspiration is that they're a visibly queer and trans person doing field research. And it's been really bolstering to know that there's other people in the canopy who don't fit the stereotype of the straight white male scientist. <laughs> That's great. Um, boy, you know, it's hard for me to answer that question, Salix. It's, it's a great question. And I think the whole idea of assisted migration is is so much, you know, it's a field or a subfield of ecology and, and climate change mitigation that is so in its infancy that we're really having to approach it with, with great care. And I think we can take some lessons from integrated pest management where, you know, you try to eradicate one pest and by introducing a predator and, you know, we there are these unforeseen consequences that can come up. So I don't really have a good answer for you other than, you um, if, if it were me trying to approach that, I would really want to know as much as I could about the natural history of the places where you're going to be, you know, putting these these voles into. And so I would want to proceed any kind of action like that with a really thorough 
not just inventory of what are the other small mammals up there, but what is their behavior? What foods do they rely upon uh, before I would take that first step? And, you know, there's a sense of, well, there's no time for all that because because of the urgency of what's going on with climate change. But at the same time, when we think about some of the other examples that we have of real disasters going on, when we start playing ecologists, um, I think it behooves us to just take great care and take the time that we need to answer those questions. That's great. So um, a couple, I, again, I'm trying to link up some some uh, some questions that are, and comments that are somewhat related. So, um, one question was asking about uh, any ideas on how young people can get involved in research. And then another more specific question um, from Madison, who, who is a 23 year old female prospective graduate student trying to get, who is inspired by your work and ambition and, and currently reaching out to labs and it's so competitive. And do you have any advice mm -hmm. on how to join uh, a good lab to do research that they're yeah. uh, passionate about? So. I guess, to, you know, basically in general, how do people get involved, whether inside or outside of academia? And then secondly, more specifically, how does one get into, you know, graduate study in academia? Those are, those are really great questions. Um, really, I think it's a matter of persistence, of knowing your interests, of not being afraid to approach any scientist at all and expressing your interests, your background and why you want to work in his or her lab. Um, the marvelous thing about the scientific record is that the name and the address of the person who wrote the, an article that you might be interested in is right there on the title page of that article. And so you can get the email of that person. You can create a lovely one to two paragraph introduction about yourself, perhaps attach a one page resume of what you've done. But in it, simply say, I read. So the first step is going to the library and finding articles that you're interested in. Say you're interested in red voles and temperate forests and the effects of climate change on them. Well, you can just go to the web of science and your research library. You can get any number of articles on the topics of red voles, of temperate forests and of climate mitigation and just spend the day in the library reading those articles or read them online. I'm exposing my old age here. Like, to to library. library. <laughs> you, can, you can start reading the articles. And if one really strikes your fancy, like, wow, that was a really cool study, or that's a place where I really want to study, or that that article really had a lot to say about climate change mitigation. Then you draft that letter to that researcher and you say, my name is blah, blah, blah. <laughs> I am a student. I'm just graduating from high school or I'm just graduating from college. I'm deeply interested in your field. I enjoyed and read several times the article that you wrote, which was in the Journal of Animal Ecology. And believe me, scientists are so egotistical that whenever somebody <laughs> has read your article, they love you automatically. And just say, and be ready to say, you know, to have a no or no response. When I was a senior in college, I had two great loves, field ecology and modern dance. But I did not have a good idea about what it would really be like to feel, be a field biologist or a modern dancer. So I thought I should experience those really before I make my choice. So I wrote letters to 60 field stations, to the directors of 60 field stations all over the world, just saying, I'll do anything. I don't need much money. I just want to get the experience of working in a rainforest you know, field station. And I didn't hear from any of them except for one one out of 60. And he said, if you can get your way out to Papua New Guinea, you can work as my field assistant, which I did. I earned money. I got out to this field station and I worked for a year as a field assistant at this little research station in a remote area of Papua New Guinea. And I got a flavor of what it was like to be a field biologist. Then I spent a year in Paris, France doing modern dance. And when I compared the two, I decided I want to be a field biologist. But it was like this, right? You have to write 60 letters possibly before you get a yes. So I would just say, be persistent and follow what it is. Find those articles, find those researchers that are of interest to you. And you may not find one that is like what you wanna do exactly. Like this guy I worked for in New Guinea, he was an entomologist. I'm not, a, I'm not an entomologist, but you know, I got some experience. And after that experience, I was then able to go to other labs and other places to pursue it. So it may not be perfect, but it's something. That's great. Um, I we're running. Uh, it's getting a bit late, so I think we're going to have to wrap up fairly soon. I want to sort of feed you a, 
a couple more questions kind of in a bundle and you can sort of handle it how you wish. And then I apologize to anybody whose questions uh, we haven't gotten to. Um, and uh, um, so a, a couple of things about canopy in general, um, one uh, uh, asking, what is about canopy ecosystem management? Does that happen from the ground or from the canopy itself? And is there any specific manage management techniques that are isolated just to the canopy of forests? And then a somewhat related question asking about, um, uh, is there any insights from the canopy that have been uh, particularly important for climate change mitigation? And, th and then I'll just give you one, the other question, which is which is a slightly different take from Christine, who who uh, uh, said she was particularly appreciating uh, your comments about being rooted in a particular place for a long time, and wonders uh, how that might be translated to to the many of us who live in our own home study site garden mm. in a way that can embrace and inform clients climate science. Mm. So yeah. I know that's a big bundle. So any it piece is. of that that you had, yeah. yeah. So uh, I think, you know, forest canopy management um, historically has actually been done more by terrestrial silviculturists and, and foresters than by canopy researchers. So practices like thinning, uh, practices like pruning, all of those affect the structure and the composition of the forest canopy. Um, I would say that the new tools that are coming now, well, they're not so new anymore, things like LIDAR, things like uh, remote sensing, using uh, multispectral um, uh, sensors in terms of being able to read out, not just like how much forest is there in an area, but how what is the water use? What is the phot photosynthetic capacity of, of these different layers of foliage? All of those are tools that are really basically can be applied to forest management and forest canopy management. So I think it's a really exciting time uh, to think about being a forest ecologist or a forest silviculturalist and having these tools available to manage the shape and size and function and, and sort of composition of the canopy. Um, in terms of long-term, you know, long, this idea of being loyal to a, a particular site, I think there's a lot, as I said in my former answer, I think there's a lot to be said for that. I think that we can learn a lot by looking at the same ecosystem, whether it's as small as a patch of garden in your backyard, or whether it's a landscape level stretch of gamble oak that you constantly visit, or you repeatedly visit, um, or even periodically visit, you're going to be making observations that inform you about aspects of natural history and ecology that I think can really provide insights on these longer term questions um, that that are arising, especially with respect to um, to natural history and, and also with respect to climate change. For example, just in my neighborhood, when I first moved to Utah 12 years ago, there were these orange lichens that were really common in the city. Like they would cover, you know, it was like, oh good, there's an epiphyte, there's a canopy dwelling lichen. At least I have that here in this horrible <laughs> dry area. I miss the Pacific Northwest wetness so much, but at least there was this orange lichen. But you know, over the years, I have just casually noticed like, oh my God, the, those lichens are not in the city anymore. I still see them in the foothills when I go hiking up there, but they, they've disappeared. But I, and now I kick myself like, shit, I should have been taking pictures. I should have documented this. I should have had little mini quadrats on my neighborhood trees, but I didn't. But nonetheless, those lichens have told me, those trees have spoken to me with my little magic microphone of science that in fact, the atmosphere, whether it's increased pollution with the inversions that we have here or the increased dryness, because we're now in a 25 year mega drought and these lichens are actually sensitive to that. I don't know what the mechanism is, but by just these casual observations of, of going running in my neighborhood every day, I've been able to come to some observation, if not conclusion, about something that relates to natural history and climate change, perhaps um, in my own neighborhood. So I would really encourage everybody to to find that thing they keep looking at, the trees that they walk by, the you know the the birds that nest or don't nest in the cemetery above where you live and and treat those as a worthy area, a worthy set of organisms to watch, to observe, and to eventually understand and communicate to other people. Yeah, absolutely. I just want to you know emphasize that uh, what you said there I think is great because 
I think sometimes there's a there's a misconception um, that to do natural history we have to go to exotic places, right. and and those are great examples. Um, and the question included great examples of just that everywhere we are, there's something to see that oftentimes it, it can be enlightening and uh, life affirming for us, but also can yield important information. Uh, right. It comes to mind a, a great ecologist who some of us know, um, Peter Feinzinger, has been doing a great program for many years down in South America where he now lives a, called you know, Backyard Ecology, which is basically tr trying to train kids and, and just citizens in general to pay more attention to what's right around them. And so that's a good example that you had. Yeah. Well, we've 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 we could obviously keep talking for a long time, but I think we need to pull it uh, to a close here. And uh, again, I apologize to anybody whose questions we did not get to. Um, so, Nalini, thank you so much. Uh, what a pleasure it's been this evening, and thank you so much for all your great work in the world. Um, thank you to all of you for being with us uh, here this evening, taking time out of your busy lives. And uh, again, I wanted to to repeat, uh, mention again that the uh, this evening's program is uh, available, will be available uh, immediately on the Natural History Institute YouTube channel. So if you just go to YouTube and you put in Natural History Institute, oh, and it looks like one of our folks behind the scenes is uh, maybe putting a link there. Um, and uh, and feel, you know, we would encourage you to, to share that link with anybody who you, you think should have been here tonight. And also, uh, uh, again, thank you on behalf of the Natural History Institute. If you if you not uh, haven't been with us before in any of these programs, we encourage you to sign up on the Natural History Institute website, which is just naturalhistoryinstitute.org, uh, and get on the mail list to learn about um, uh, other programs and to support this good work. So again, good night to everyone. Thank you again, Nalini. Thank you, Tom. <laughs>